Dr. Scavella, um, one of the women that uh, my veterans, my, my staff spoke to, woman veteran, in preparation for this hearing uh, is being re reassigned a new primary care provider as her current one is retiring. She is concerned she will be assigned a male physician. Uh, on the other hand, on my way to the airport on Monday, I stopped unannounced at a VA clinic in Kansas City, Kansas, and visited with the veterans in the lobby and uh, this female veteran was telling me that she's getting good care, but she'd prefer just to be treated as a veteran, not a woman veteran. Uh, my staff tells me that's not an unusual uh, circumstance. And in the view of this woman, she believed that she was not oper uh, offered that opportunity. She was only eligible for care on the women's clinic side of the VA. So uh, one, I don't, my understanding now is that that's not the case. I don't know what the educational or comments were made to this veteran in the waiting room, but in each instance, they're, they're looking for a specific kind of provider. One, just the general VA, and one would really like to have a woman doctor. Tell me, tell me how this works at the VA. Yeah, so thank you for that question, Ranking Member Moran. We, I am a 25-year-old uh, year veteran of working within the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I took care of uh, women and men um, in uh, Baltimore um, and was very proud to do so. I had some women who wanted to see whomever they could and did not have a preference, and I had some women who specifically wanted a specific gender, whether it was a male physician or a female physician, and it is their choice. We are currently, in, the, in this current day, we are, are required to offer um, women veterans the opportunity to have the um, clinician of their choice. They can choose a woman, they can choose a man. Um, and we continue to do that. Um, it is their choice. And so we find some who really feel really safe in those um, sex um, uh, concordant uh, relationships for their provision of care or there are some that uh, don't have a preference. We just need to make sure we meet their needs. Doctor, this committee has, has been attempting to help the VA solve its uh, provider shortage, and we just heard about that in mammography. Um, is there a shortage in, in doctors who are female at the VA? So if you ask for a, a, a doctor who's a female, um, do you, is that a, a given? So I think we do reflect the US um, population for women who are in medicine. We may be a little still discordant uh, as far as having how many women. I'm going to actually ask Dr. Haskell if she knows that number, but I, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, first I, I did want to. Excuse me, is that better? Yeah. Much better. Um, I did want to say that um, in regard to, um, well, first of all, let me answer your question, which is that I, I do believe that more than 50% of the providers in VA, at least in primary care and in mental health, I believe are female. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't have a shortage of female providers. But I did want to say in regard to um, women uh, being able to have a choice of providers that um, we require that all women are offered assignment to um, a women's health provider um, but um, we, our goal is really to have at least 85% of all women uh, assigned to women's health providers. So it means that we are taking into account the fact that there will certainly be some women who prefer to be assigned to a regular primary care provider, not in a specific women's clinic. I didn't know exactly how to ask that question, yeah. what, what the right words were, but I, there, I can assure, this, this testimony will assure the, the veteran I visited with that she has the choice, and yes. even if it's offered, it doesn't have to be accepted. Exactly, Great. that's correct, thank you. Um, let me talk a moment about a kind of a common complaint, of, and that is the community care, and it's uh, at least the, the veterans we visited with are concerned that the doctors, the providers are not being paid in a timely fashion. They're leaving, they're taking away the opportunity to, to provide community care to veterans. Um, in many places, we need to be growing community care, uh, in particularly rural places. And in, in, with maternity care only being provided uh, within the community, um, are, we, are we cognizant of the fact that we need to make sure that community care works for the provider and for the veteran? In other words, are we caring for the, the, the timeliness, the, the timeliness of payment? Uh, those kind of things that make community care still a viable option 
uh, in places across the country for maternity care and for places across rural America for uh, veterans and their wide array of need for medical services. So thank you for that question. Since I see we're at time, I will actually defer to Dr. Johnson for that answer. Um, Dr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you very much. I think that's an important concern and a critical concern. And absolutely, our maternity care is provided entirely in the community. And, be, and the reason for that is we cover about 7,000 deliveries across our large integrated healthcare system. And in order to provide high quality maternity care, we really require enough volume to provide that care in a safe manner. So if we're doing 7,000 deliveries a year across a large integrated healthcare system, we just don't have enough volume to build that infrastructure within VA, which would include neonatologists, NICUs, neo neonatal intensivists, all of those things that we need to have in place to provide care, um, safe maternity care. And I, as an OBGYN who actually works in a rural area, um, am well aware of the needs of women in those states. And, and what we have as a healthcare system is a priority to ensure that our community care networks are adequate so that we are able to provide that care to the veterans we serve no matter where they live. And then also leverage our telehealth um, ability that we have within our healthcare system to provide our veterans with tablets that have um, broadband access. So even those folks in rural areas are able to connect with their providers um, remotely if that's possible. Now for some, for some OB care, that has to be done face to face. And we're aware that for folks living in rural areas, they may need to travel for some of that. Um, one of the programs that I'm very proud of is our maternity care coordination program. And Dr. Bob Baptista mentioned it a little bit. We work um, quite closely together. When we look at whether our maternity care coordination program is meeting the needs of the veterans we serve, but that program was developed to recognize that we have veterans who are using maternity care who are automatically getting dual care, meaning they get care in VA for their mental health care, their primary care, and they must be getting care in the community. So it's really critical to have that care coordination piece that works to center the veteran and their needs with both their community provider and their VA providers. Dr. Johnson, thank you. You've testified before us before, and I appreciate your testimony. Senator mm -hmm. King, I'm sorry, that, but Senator Tester allowed me a third question, and then I'm, mm -hmm. I'm leaving to return to Intelligence Committee, where you and I came from. <laughs> yes. um, Ms. Britton, 2018 VA Inspector General report found that 49% of military sexual trauma claims were not properly processed. The result of that was that veterans, according to the Inspector General, were the were being prematurely denied benefits they were owed. In 2021, the IG followed up with recommendations and found about 57% of denied MST claims were still not being properly reviewed. Um, it doesn't seem that the VA has this right yet. Uh, can you explain how the percentage of MST claims being improperly processed increased by such an alarming percentage after the 2018 IG report and what VBA is taking, uh, what actions VBA is taking to make sure it doesn't continue. Thank you, sir. Uh, first and foremost, um, I would like to say that we do recognize the declination in the accuracy rate of the MST claims processing. As a result of the 2021 IG report, uh, we did centralize our claims processing to um, specialized sites to process our MST cases. Uh, with those cases being specialized, being centralized, um, we provided specialized training to those claims processors to ensure that they have the necessary technical knowledge to be able to process those MST cases. Um, we started out with five um, sites to process those cases, and we most recently centralized to one location um, under one senior executive with those specialized claims processors. Uh, we have within our um, receipt uh, the special focus review that yielded a 20 71% accuracy rate for FY23 uh, for MS Teams claims processing. What centralizing the claims has done for us is it's allowed us to um, really hone in on, uh, on the the errors that we've seen in the claims process. Um, with the special focus review, um, we took a deep dive into that and we are revamping how we're doing quality. 
Uh, so we generally look at our employee quality, which is 97%. Um, with the 71% that was achieved on the special focus review, we actually took a step back and we modified how we're assessing our MST cases. Now we will begin um, looking at those MST cases and the accuracy level of those on a monthly basis as opposed to an annual basis, which is what we've traditionally done um, as directed in the OIG report. Um, this would allow us to do three reviews at the employee level, um, which also expands the number of reviews that we're doing annually. So with that special focus review, we did a little bit over 200. Um, reviews, this would give us the opportunity to look at 15,000 um, of those MST cases to make sure that we're assessing the accuracy of those in flight. So we'll no longer be waiting until claims are completed to look at whether or not they are done right. We will do in-process reviews along the way, and instead of doing that at the claim level, we will do that at the employee level to make sure that those employees are being trained properly. Uh, we are looking at our top error trends. We are developing targeted training uh, to make sure that those claims processors have that training. And I am happy to report that even though we have seen that 71% accuracy rate, we have seen an increase in the grant rate uh, for our MST, um, our MST survivors. So we've seen a grant increase in the grant rate from 2011. Um, it was at 56%, so we're now looking at 62% um, for our um, grant rate for our MST survivors. Ms. Britton, it'd be unfair to my colleagues to ask any follow-up questions, but perhaps we can, after the hearing, uh, my staff and you can have a conversation and, and uh, or we can have a conversation elsewhere, but we'll follow up with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.